Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert and Joe Salustio with contributions by Elvin Freitas is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Get your Kindle edition or your softbound book. It's going to be amazing. If you're someone who's passionate about transforming education, which you are if you're listening to this podcast, you should check out the Charles Koch Foundation. The Charles Koch Foundation supports social entrepreneurs and organizations that are embracing innovation to build better solutions for today's learners. Visit ckf.org to learn more. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the EdUp Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salusio back with you here in another episode, a very interesting episode. And I think we're going to get into, or at least I'm going to force my guest and my guest co-host to just lightly touch on, uh, we're just a day and a half away from uh, Joe Biden's announcement of student debt relief and debt forgiveness for many, many, many people across this great land. I've talked to Bill Pepicello, my super guest host, enough about this to know that he has very strong opinions on this matter. And I'm sure Mallory does too, but that gives you some sense of, uh, boy, is there a shining light on higher education right now, hopefully in a positive way, no matter what you feel about uh, the debt relief, uh, the shining light on higher ed is good, right? Because it gives us a chance to reestablish the value of higher education to those that question it. So having attention, they always say, there any press is good press and you know so you wonder is is that the case that we're in now anyway you heard who i have with me here he is ladies and gentlemen he's dr bill pepicello and he's the guru of online learning bell what's going on hey joe good to uh, be with you again today i uh, i know you need the help <laughs> bill this this might this is actually this button's labeled bill i just sit here and i imagine myself having you as a co-host and i practice hitting it uh, anyway, um, how are you, Bill? How's life? Life is good here. Uh, I have uh, just come back from uh, almost a month in Switzerland and Austria and am preparing Whoa. in a week to take off uh, for Norway. So I'm just uh, enjoying the good life here in retirement. Well, you know, we were just talking about important meetings that you used to attend, Bill, but now you have important meetings in other countries. Like well, uh, what time you're going to eat dinner? Whether you should have a beer or a straight uh, straight shot of vodka, right? Uh, well, and what time the buffet opens? That's always important. And then in, in between, of Cheers. course, in between, I'm uh, I'm still uh, recording my own podcast, Ed Up Insights, with uh, Bill Pepicello, which uh, comes out weekly, so I uh, people can look for that. Are we going to have an episode coming soon on debt relief, Bill? I have a feeling you might be doing an episode on that. Yes, actually, I, I touched on it. Um, oh, I don't know. Early on, a month or so ago, um, briefly. But yeah, there'll be uh, there'll be more coming on that. Well, I know somebody else that has a lot to say about what's happening in higher education right now, and that's my amazing guest, and she has a lot of energy, and I can tell you, it's very positive energy already because we've talked to her, and I'm already feeling inspired. Here she is. Ladies and gentlemen, she's Dr. Mallory Duenal Palish, and she's Chancellor of Reach Education. Mallory, how are you? I'm great. How are you? You know, another day in paradise, Mallory, right? We we work in higher ed. How much better could it would be unfair if it was any better, you know? Fair enough. I'm just waiting to find out what my button's gonna be. So there you go. Oh, well, I've got some choices for you. Let's see how the episode goes. All right. Um, Mallory, let's so we always like to do a level set here for those that haven't heard about Reach Education and the work that you're doing. What do you do and how do you do it? Yeah, absolutely. So Reach University is a regionally accredited nonprofit university, uh, and we do exactly one thing, which is partner with school districts to help them end their teacher shortages by taking their existing classified staff roles, paraprofessionals, classroom aides, etc., and turning that into an apprenticeship degree pathway that culminates in students getting credit for their work, making sense of that job, and graduating with a college degree and teaching credential to fill one of the vacant classrooms in their community. How do you mean that you turn it into an apprenticeship opportunity? What does that look like? Because that's kind of a hot button issue in higher ed right now, right? Absolutely. And especially for teaching in particular, February of this year, apprenticeship with a capital A became a thing when Tennessee became the first state to get federally recognized teaching apprenticeships set up. Uh, and now Secretary Cardona has called on all 50 states to set up apprenticeship teaching pathways to help address teacher shortages. 
However, even before apprenticeships with a capital A came into place uh, six months ago uh, at the federal level, this was with a lowercase a, it was just something that made sense. So what I mean by this is, I'll back up a little bit. My PhD was in rural teacher shortages, and this is became the foundation of what our degree design is. And what we found was this idea that people living in a community where you know average family income would be in the twenty thousand or so dollars a year, the idea that they would leave home, go take on tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, and then go back to that small remote rural area and hope there was a job waiting there for them, where even at the end, you know, 35 years later of teaching, they might make it to $40,000 a year in wages, it wasn't going to happen. Oh. And so the idea here for us was like this, the market's not clear. We're never going to address teacher shortages under that structure. So we were thinking about apprenticeships with a lower case A starting about a decade ago. And, and what we mean by that is, can people get paid for the job they're already doing as a paraprofessional? They're already getting real world experience, right? We talk about student teaching. And if you do that for 10 weeks, you're supposed to be qualified. What if you were working for the whole entirety of the three to four year bachelor's degree, working with kids, doing real world experience. And then we were helping you make sense of that. And we were covering that supplemental training through the cost of Pell grants, now registered apprenticeship dollars, but before just Pell, so that the net result was, you're not only not taking on student loan debt, you're going in and actually getting paid to earn this college degree and then working as a teacher once you finish. Morning. Uh, so that sounds good, right? Uh, no dad and and uh, but ties to what we mentioned earlier when I was going through the intros about uh, debt and uh, students' unwillingness sometimes to take it on. And when it does come on, if they don't finish their degree or don't get the credential they want, sometimes it's hard to figure it out. In teacher, uh, with teachers in particular, there just aren't enough people that want to be teachers right now. And it's just a big deal, right? Pandemic, uh, low pay, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, you think about the passion of teachers and they really have to want to do it because there's so many factors against being a teacher. I said this on a previous podcast. I don't remember who I was talking to a long time ago. My daughter said she wanted to be a teacher immediately. And I didn't even think about it. I was like, oh, no, 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 don't do that. There's not enough money. Oh, wait a minute. I'm talking to a six-year-old. And let me stop doing that right now. She just wants to be a teacher. We don't pay our teachers enough. How you, so the apprenticeships are you getting them earlier in the journey to move them up faster so that they stay in the profession? Is that kind of the idea of, of the working apprenticeship? Kind of, right? I think that one of the things we're looking at is I actually don't think that there's a shortage of people who want to be teachers. There are mm. 1.3 million people in the United States, 1.3 million Whoa. who work as classroom aides and paraprofessionals, right? When we talk about teacher vacancies right now hitting an all time high we think there's somewhere in the 200 to 300,000 teachers vacancies total, right? Now for these paraprofessionals, the idea that they could triple their salary and have more autonomy and leadership in the classroom, be recognized for the knowledge that they have and have a stable pension in retirement, that's actually a really good deal. There are, I don't think it would be hard to sell a paraprofessional on moving up into that teaching role. That would right. be great. The problem is they can't afford the college degree they need to get there. So I, I think there's a lot to be clear that we need to do as a former teacher myself and as a former school leader myself, there is a lot we need to do to make teachers feel valued and respected. We do need to increase teacher pay, but those things need to happen. And at the same time, I think there are so many people who want to be teachers right now that we've locked out of the profession by making a degree absolutely financially unrealistic for them. Mm. Bill Pepicello, would you like to come into this conversation? I certainly would. I'm, Are you uh, sure? Yeah. Yes, I'm did you sure. Say so, Bill, did you say something? No. Oh, okay, all right, all right, stop. That's enough. Well, there, there, are, there are a number of things I'd love to, to touch on because uh, number one, uh, the relationship in your model of uh, theory to application goes to the very heart of uh, the University of Phoenix and John Sperling. Um, and since I know you were in the Bay Area, you probably ran across John Sperling at some point. But his, his philosophy was much like your model, and that is you, you don't need to quit what you're doing and go to school and come back um, at, you know, at great financial uh, hardship in order to, uh, to be successful. And especially for 
for teachers, uh, I think it's important. And my, my daughter, I have a daughter who's a teacher. If you can help people who are already employed in the education area to pursue that degree, you know, they're not just getting the, the degree background, but they're finding out what all else is going into uh, education these days. And by that specifically, my one of my uh, latest podcasts is on all of the issues that we face in higher education and K-12 today that weren't necessarily the hot button issues in the past. You know, all of the, the issues with gender identification and students um, having um, a variety of um, of personal uh, issues that they have to deal with. And sometimes teachers don't realize that when they come into the teaching profession and go, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't what I expected at all. And I think one of the great things about, um, about your model is that they know exactly what they're getting into because they live it every day. And I think that's, uh, that's something that's really, uh, really important. But I, it, that was there said, a question in there, Bill? It's I, coming. I'm not sure if there wait, was one in there. Wait for it. All right, I'm waiting for it. Now I'm I'm interested because um, teacher certification is one of the bugaboos of higher education, and I've done it in a number of states, including California. Do you find that the the credentialing process itself is one of the greatest obstacles to the teacher success? I, I do think that there are serious needs to rethink how we credential. I'll say for Reach University in one state, in the state of California, we do the full suite of credentialing and licensing. In every other state that we are in, we partner with an alternative certification provider and tell, tell them, we will make sure candidates show up to you with a bachelor's degree, having passed their practice exam, already placed in a school, and we will articulate with you, and you can do the local credentialing that is required. And one of the reasons for that is, again, not thinking, thinking about education as a business, because it is a business, we're talking about skew control and skew complexity, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that I have 50 different credentials that I might need in a given state times 50 different states. And now every time there is an update to a legislation or a state requires a new requirement for mastery, um, there's before we even get to the people wanting to get those degrees, the people providing those degrees and credentials to them have to go manage that and do those updates. And that does drive up cost. And Yikes. so it is expensive to get a credential now for reasons that have nothing to do with quality and more to do with what I would argue is unnecessary, just skew variation in all of these differentiated products. Confused. Easy yeah. to become confused. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I have one other question before I uh, let Joe interrupt me again. Um, one of the things that's interesting, again, about your model is that it's, it's based on the Oxford tutorial model. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of people probably uh, aren't, aren't familiar with that. I know Joe knows nothing about it. So could you tell us a little bit about how that model works? Absolutely. And, and before I talk about how it works, I think what's really important is how we got here, right? And let's talk about um, Oxford University has existed for the past thousand years. And it's had all sorts of problems around gender and race and classism, et cetera. And if you set all of those aside, here's what we also know is for the last thousand years, if you knew someone in the Western world was going to become the prime minister of your country, right? Or they were going to become one of your titans of industry, that's where you sent them. Disproportionately, Oxford or Cambridge is where they ended up going. And what that meant is a model emerged there. It's called the supervisory system in Cambridge. It's the tutorial system in Oxford. And it's built with an assumption of what we required of world leaders 200 years ago, but what I think now in our modern economy is required of any skilled worker. And it was this idea that, okay, I'm gonna have to work with incomplete information to solve problems where there isn't a clear right answer. And then I'm gonna have to make that bet and stick it out and adjust when it doesn't make sense, right? There's, there was this understanding that the idea that you could have a perfect schema of the world and have all of the information and come to the right answer was not realistic. And so that was how people were trained because it equipped them to become leaders in their organizations, whether that was a country or a company or anything in between. By contrast, uh, as someone who came up through uh, the K-12 system as a teacher and then looks at a lot of times how we think about university instruction, 
I think there's oftentimes an effort to sterilize that, right? We, in economics, there's a term for it as an economics major and it's ceteris paribus, right? Like let's hold set, like hold separate and hold constant all of the complexity of the world. Here's a problem. I want you to go through and solve it. And when you get the exact same answer as your TA, you know, you're right. And that's how we think a lot about higher ed. The problem is there's no world in which that's what you actually need to do. If you're going to get a college degree to be a skilled contributor to society, there is no job where that is what you're actually going to be asked to do. So, so that is like as a founding premise where we started was what has actually in its spirit and its design been built to help people manage the complexities of informational asymmetry, informational overload, informational conflict in the 21st century. And that's the tutorial system for us. And what we mean by that, getting to your actual question now of how that works, uh, is this idea that it is, it's a dialectic, right? So how a traditional tutorial works, you'll meet with your professor, your tutor, once every week or every two weeks, and they will give you more reading than you could possibly complete in the next two weeks by design. And they will give you an open-ended question, right? If you're in a philosophy class, like who's right, Voltaire or Mills around <laughs> human nature, right? If you're in an econ class, um, will, will debt forgiveness, will student loan forgiveness cause inflation, right? Questions where people can conflict and argue and debate. And the idea is you're responsible for going and taking the knowledge that's out there, figuring out how to make sense of more knowledge than could exist, than, than you could possibly parse through, come up with a thesis, and then have to defend your answer. And your professor's entire job is to play devil's advocate and to push you off of it and to make you really think through why you believe what you believe. Confused. So that's the general premise. And what we use it for is to make sure confusion turns the students into um, the, the clarity that comes on the other side of confusion, right? I'm working every day. Theory says that I should see kids that perform this way in class, that are developing this way in class, but they're developing that way. Why? What's going on? And we ask them to use that tutorial method to make sense of the gaps between theory and practice and to develop their own thesis about what it means to be a good practitioner. That's a knowledge bomb for you, Bill Pepicello. That's a knowledge bomb uh, for me. I feel much more prepared in life, I have to be honest, after that explanation. Mallory, and then, you know, th to build on that, um, the relevance and applicability of the education, right? So you have the seminar, and then this this is, I love this about your site, as you, you know, you go through the uh, model, the reach method, and the one, I read through these, and I was like, yeah, yeah, a couple of them are um, what you would say for any university operating online, and I mean, there's a compliment, you know, flexibility, it's not like affor affordability, we, we want to be able to say that as universities, but the one that I just loved was relevance and applicability. Learning is relentlessly, right? That, that word seems so intentional. Learning is relentlessly tailored to the workplace with theory linked to practice throughout. This is, um, this is a, su such a big issue as higher education in general talks about responding to business and industry, updating curriculum, making sure it's reflective of how b business moves and how technology moves. And oh, wait, our curriculum is three years old. We have to update it. Oh, we can't update it. There's no reason. It's like most of the students, especially if you're in the adult market, are working. How do you build curriculum around the student instead of building curriculum around the university and doing what you think the student should do? Isn't that the difference when you relentlessly tailor something to the workplace? You give the student, I don't know, more incentive to learn because they're doing it in their That's own right. environment. That's right. And I think it's about making their job the curriculum, right? So it's not just about adding your own curriculum that's relevant, but actually saying your job, we you can't be in our program unless you are working with kids in a school setting every day. And so your job is a big part of the curriculum. And I think in higher education, integration and relevance feels like a dirty word, right? Especially amongst four years institutions, we see that as the purview of community colleges, that's vocational technology, and that's somehow beneath us, right? The more esoteric, the more removed from reality, the better, the more jargon, the better. And there's a reason no one wants to hire a first year teacher, right? There's a reason no one wants that person in their building. It's because you don't know what the hell you're doing. And so the idea for us that this should be starting with people who First of all, their school leader already knows them and knows that they've got it. They've got the instincts, they've got the talent, they'd be a great teacher. And that then what we're doing is helping them make sense of what they're doing, that their job is the curriculum and we're just helping them make sense of it and building on top of that 
um, that's a foundational, non-negotiable piece of our method. Too many learners are being left behind by the current one-size-fits-all model of education. We here at EdUp and our friends at the Charles Koch Foundation see a better path forward. The Charles Cook Foundation supports innovators in education who are building and scaling new pathways to allow all learners to discover their potential. By changing the way we think about education, we can unlock opportunities for millions more Americans. To learn more about the Charles Koch Foundation support of individualized education, visit ckf.org. Bill, don't you think that's what all of higher ed wants to say? your job is the curriculum and so many of us try to say it or infer it but Mallory just kind of says it and that is a differentiator don't you think absolutely i mean it cuts to the heart i mean there were so many um i don't want to say irrelevant but many issues out there that impinge upon the, the basic um, importance and, and the basic job of education these days that if you can get to the heart of it, which I think your model does, uh, that really goes a long way, you know, both directions. It helps higher ed get its act together, but in so doing, it's the, K the K-12 system. As, as Joe knows, one of, my, uh, uh, one of my real issues with education in general is that, um, you know, higher education will tell us that, well, you know, teachers aren't, aren't uh, at the level they should be when they go into the K-12 system. And, and my response to that is, well, who the hell trained those people to go into the K-12 system? Right. And they don't like that, uh, that particular question. But I think you've, what, you've, you've cutting past it because you're doing it from the inside. And in that is, to me, is what makes it more valuable and makes it valuable as a, as a model in general for, for education at all levels. It comes from the inside, not from the outside um, being, uh, you know, manipulating. Well, thank you. And that's our goal, right? We, in full transparency, I never started out with the goal of I want to found a university. The challenge was we could not get other universities when you know, the first few years of our journey was talking to other universities and trying to sell them on this idea. And we couldn't get any takers. And sometimes really? it was philosophical. I know, right? It was shocking. Um, I thought we were very compelling and, and everyone would agree. Everyone would pay it lip service. And then when the time would come, you know, one of our, when we say relevance, we mean that at least 50% of the credit hours you're working towards your degree have to come from the job. It does have to be equal parts your job and then us helping you make sense of your job. And every university, this was a non-starter, right? We can give six credits of credit for prior learning. We can you know, waive introductory classes, but they still need to take the total number of units. We can give them electives. It was nothing that was actually moving the needle towards making the job as foundational a piece of the degree as anything else. And so that, and that was, we could hear the pearl get like clutching, right? When we would ask people to do this, you could hear them gasp and clutch their pearls at this idea. And so, um, yeah, it's, it is a non-negotiable for us. And it's the reason why we had to go the long way around and, and get our own university set up. Sure. Do you, you think about, you think about, well, I was just going to say how many, how, if you go to a university with that in mind, you immediately ask them to look at a policy and break it. And we're just not good at it. We're not good at going, you know, we, we go, well, it's six credits for this, or we get not, nine credits from this degree to that degree. And how many Carnegie units is, you know, is this class going to be less or more? And how, you know, uh, what, what about who's going to confer the degree and how much is residency? And, you know, and then it's like, by the time you're done with it, half the time it's like, I don't even want to partner with, I don't even want to partner. It's too hard. It's, it's so hard to partner that you don't almost want to don't you don't want to do it if you're from business and industry sometimes or if you're doing something outside of the higher ed norm and i've heard that from business leaders it's like it's too hard we're just going to do it ourselves or we'll go to this other giant juggernaut company that's thinking about doing education instead of partnering with you because it's too tough and if you're starting something out like founding a university a great way to get into the game is to partner with other universities who generally don't have a lot of interest in helping sometimes. And I am not speaking for everyone to make the disclaimer. I'm only speaking about, you know, who you are, those of you out there. Um, and there are some that can help, right? But it is a barrier. It's like a barrier to entry. Yep. Yeah. And, and that is, you know, that's, 
what we saw, right, was we in our industry, and I, I will say REACH is now starting to do some collective impact work with universities and community colleges in other industries. And we're, this is the exact thing we're driving at, right, is at the end of the day, if higher ed fails to recognize that one of our fundamental value propositions is preparation for the workforce, then we all we will become obsolete and irrelevant because employers will just start saying, I'm going to find substitutes, I'm going to find alternatives. And they, they will do that, even in education, right? Two states this summer have started to say, you don't need a bachelor's degree to be a teacher, right? Where, where do we think that comes from? Why is that coming? And we can lament, we can say it shouldn't be that way. More states are gonna follow suit unless we get our act together. And so the first step is higher ed has to recognize that we don't get to ignore the workforce. And then the second thing we have to understand is that, as I'm gonna say this as nicely as I can, the workforce does not care about our legislation and our policies, right? The workforce has its own industry to run, right? They've got their own job to do. You sitting there and wanting them to count Carnegie credits is a fast way to no matter where they started to lose them. And so it has to start with this idea of what are your goals as an industry? What do you need higher ed to prepare people to do that you can't do on your own? And now it's my job to go figure out how I can make sure this is in good standing with the FSA, with my accreditor, with state authorization. That's my job. But you can just rest assured that you said this is what needs to happen. I'm going to make sure that that happens. And we have to take that on as our mantle. That's Bill, great. I can see you chomping on your microphone. I am. Well, and you're going to enjoy it because I'm actually going to agree with you on something. Amazing. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that, uh, that you have trouble with your model, Mallory, is that it's hard. You know, you, you can't come into the, into the classroom and listen to a lecture and take a test and get your <laughs> grade and then go into the classroom. But I'm going to paraphrase something you said, so feel free to correct me. I think what one of the things you said is the real world, the business world, is competency-based. Mm -hmm. Higher education is not by and large. Your model is, is a masked competency-based model. I mean, it may look sort of semi-traditional, but it's really competency-based. And as you say, that's what the business world is looking for. And that's what higher ed is not preparing its students for. That's right. And I think what higher ed needs to understand is um, Clay Christensen was this incredible mentor of mine. And one of the things he always pushed us on was being very clear of who your actual competitors are. And it's easy on first blush, higher ed assumes its other competitors are other institutions of higher ed. But increasingly, as we become more and more Byzantine and more and more entrenched in our ways, our competition becomes non-consumption, right? Our competition come, becomes people saying, I'm just not gonna go to college. And employers saying, you know what, forget it. I'm not gonna need you to get a college degree. We're gonna come up with our own competency-based standards. And so I think the real risk in higher ed is we look around and if we're doing slightly better than the guy to our left or the gal to our right, we're in good shape. But that's not actually the full suite of who our competitors are, right? Our, our competition is people choosing to just not come here at all and to choose none of us. Attention. That is, the, that is so right. I talk about that all the time. I've said it on this podcast. I've said it with Bill. I can compete against another university down the street. I know I can, and I can probably beat them and, and get more students than they can. And maybe next year they'll beat me and the increase or decrease is a percent here, a percent there, 10 students there, but I'm going to lose 50% of my pool to an, a, a juggernaut that's teaching uh, courses, uh, a non, even non-credit courses outside of the traditional higher ed model. And there are some out there doing it because they were fed up with partnering with higher education thought they and, and it's hard to recruit somebody on the value of a college degree when a company says you don't need one and so the real competitor of higher education is not the other university it's the public perception that the, a, a college degree does not have value anymore and it's it's like um i'm so glad you said that mallory and i'm soapboxing a minute because not everybody maybe people refuse to see it that way but it is so deep in our society where parents and kids right now like oh you know what so and so dropped a college degree you have all these things open to you maybe you could go to college in 10 or 15 years 10 or 15 years from now you probably don't want to go to college. i mean there's all sorts of reasons why why we have to change um i i really like your model because it's a model 
facilitated as a response almost to uh, do you do you look, here's a question do you look around at your team and go you know what i've seen this before we're not going to do it that way we're going to do it this way every day every day we have a constant conversation at our organization of why do we think we need to do it that way right is it and and we really focus with who is our user and having some very clear profiles of who are our district partners our employers and then who are our students our apprentices that are going to become their teachers and and thinking very concretely this student is about to drop out because we're offering this class at 4 p.m and that conflicts with when she's supposed to be running the girls volleyball practice right and and that is what we're asking her to choose between and we're going to lose right or this student we're not making it easy to leave and come back this student just had a kid get sick or this student's school district just had someone go on maternity leave and they need them to step in and take a semester away we have we're going to lose them unless we rethink our our pause policy right our ability for you to pause and come back and there's so many times where what we have to ask ourselves is is our exemplar what other institutions of higher ed are doing or what other groups that are actually good at keeping these people in other adjacent industries what they're doing and oftentimes we realize that higher ed is the opposite of what we should be following as our example did you hear that bill bill before you jump because anyone you, you want to mallory said the pause policy because you can pause and come back we call it the leave of absence and uh, i say we i mean higher education in general most universities it's called leave of absence in the in the especially the working learner goes i'm not absent i just need to take a quick pause right and and so it's this label we provide that isn't exactly tailored to the situation it, it just the way you framed that is so much different than we frame it uh pause policy versus leave of absence it's interesting bill go ahead yeah we used to call it stopping out but stopping out isn't any better than leave of absence both of those things have a finality to them i've left or i stopped whereas pause actually is pretty cool lingo for today. You know, I'm, I'm just hitting pause. I'm not going anywhere, you know. Um, By the way, you're a, uh, aren't you a linguistics major, Bill? And you said pretty cool lingo. I don't know if that lines up with your degree, just for the record. Well, uh, actually it does because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very hip. And by the way, um, I, I, just so that you know, uh, when Mallory said ceteris paribus, that's Latin. Um, and which I know you're, you're not schooled in, but I am. And I'll, I'll explain that to you later offline. But what I wanted to follow up with you, Mallory, on was given the, you know, the, the ability to pause and the flexibility of scheduling, what's your delivery model look like? Absolutely. So the first thing I note is that this will sound contradictory, but we're big believers in cohorts. And I know that sounds contradictory to the pause policy, but what this means is students get to come into us with, uh, either 30 credits or 60 credits or zero credits, right? And they, and the reason why we do that is that then you get put on a track, right? Where you can get your degree in two years, three years, or four years. And if you come in on a given track, you know exactly what your semester will be every single semester from now until when you graduate. You don't pick classes, you don't pick the order, you go into that track. And so the, I, the reason why that matters is for so many people, again, if you are a working adult, you don't have time to sit there and count how many general ed credits do I need? How many from subject area H versus G and what even are those? And so we have a set experience that you're going to go through with all of your classmates. And what that's going to look like is you are going to have about four to five hours of online Zoom class a week. The rest will be, and when you come there, it'll be making sense of asynchronous content, right? You might be reading Piaget's theories of development or learning about best practices in math instruction, um, whatever your courses are for that semester. And then you're going and you're applying that in your job. And then you're coming into these classes at night. Uh, most of our classes start around 9 p.m. or are held on weekends. And you are then talking about, okay, my theory said this, my job said this, and, and what, what does that mean? What does that matter? And it's a discussion amongst a cohort that you're with. That cohort is really important because it is about building that trust. It is about feeling that sense of camaraderie. Um, and then if you have to pause, when you come back, you just pop down into whatever the next cohort is, right? That's coming in. We have a new cohort start every semester. So you just pop back into a new cohort and keep moving with them. So the idea is it's self-paced to an extent, but that then whenever you're in, you're in on a set track with a cohort of people, and it's it's very predictable what you'll be doing when and with whom. 
great. Like it a lot. And I, it's, uh, it's, it's ringing my ears. It's like the pizza pie model, Bill. Eight, eight slices. You could take any one before, you know, no prereqs, no uh, barriers. You pop in and pop out when you want. And no class is, is uh, a prereq of another so that you can start at any time. You know, the, the, the dark side sector that we came from kind of invented that model. Um, I say dark side, but I'm actually really proud to have come from the for-profit uh, industry in the way that it prepares you for the business of education, which is getting more and more and more important that we look at this as a business. And when you have teachers coming in to upgrade, um, it is their business. It's their job, right? Because uh, teaching is one of those areas where doesn't your degree generally lead to more pay directly? So it's not like these are vanity degrees. I mean, these people get to progress and earn more money. So it literally is that important that they get in, get out, get it done, do it when they need to and have a good experience because it is literally food on the table kind of stuff. That's right. And for our average person, again, in our districts, the average person will earn somewhere between two and a half to three times the salary the day they get that degree and become a classroom teacher instead of a paraprofessional. And so, and, and our average person is a person in their 40s with more than one child uh, living in an area where there aren't a lot of other job alternatives. We focus primarily in remote rural areas where being a teacher is one of the highest paying jobs in the community. And so this really, there's there's no need for us to motivate people as to why they get there, right? They, they came to us because they have a very clear vision of what they wanna do with this degree in the building where they already are. And with their school leader telling them that job is yours if you can get this piece of paper. And so they come with the motivation. And that is, I think that's a really important framing because it helps us understand that if a student is leaving, it's not because there's some 18 year old frat star who was too busy doing keg stands and just didn't know why they were there in the first place. If our students are leaving- Cheers. Right, right, like they're having a great time, but that's they didn't come to school to do anything with the academics a lot of times in traditional settings. That's never the case for our students. And so that gives us an ability to trust that if someone is leaving our program, it is because something has happened where our program didn't fit their life, despite the fact that they had real ambitions for getting a degree for a very clear, tangible reason. I love it. Um, and, you know, as we did last time, uh, Bill has decided that it's his responsibility to close out our episodes moving forward. So Bill, I'm going to hand it over to you for our last few questions. Wow. Gee, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Never, never mind. Never mind. I've taken it just a psych. No, go ahead. Oh, I'm just kidding. Man. Well, we, we always close out the episodes with, uh, with two questions, um, that are usually, uh, related. The first is what have, uh, has Joe not asked you that he should have, um, and what is, what additional <laughs> information would you like to give us, uh, about your institution? And secondly, what do you see as the future of higher education? Absolutely. So, so to that first one, especially knowing that there are a lot of higher ed folks listening in, there's the really wonky question of how do you do that? And I think there's this assumption that, well, it works for REACH because they got a different kind of degree, right? This is a completion degree, or this is something else that wouldn't work for us. Um, and that's actually not true. We, we conferred degrees that look exactly the same as anyone else coming out of our regionally accredited institution. And the way we are able to confer like a full degree where 50% of the credit hours are from the job itself is by rethinking where we put that in the credit counting, right? A lot of times institutions of higher ed are trying to wedge that into credit for prior learning or practicum classes or electives. And that has that's rife with problems. What we do instead is we look at the Carnegie credit itself and say, and again, I know this is very wonky, but knowing who we're listening, who we have listening, this is really important because- Yeah, this any, is a captive audience, I promise you. Any institution tomorrow could go and replicate this degree and we want them to, right? And they could do it in any industry. And the fundamental premise is going back and saying, for any given course, right? In my, every class has to take a, you know, child development 100 class if you're gonna become a teacher. In any course in America, it might be called something different, but everyone has that. Okay, so rather than get rid of that course and just give credit for practice or to slim it down, what we say is for every three credit class in a Carnegie unit, there is an assumption that one third of that is lecture, academic interaction, and then two thirds is quote unquote academic preparation, right? Homework. 
We've always assumed that homework has to be essays, you know, problem sets, et cetera. But there's no reason if you're careful about lining up with your student learning outcomes that the homework can't be the job itself, which means that without changing a single course in your existing degree scope and sequence, that you couldn't have up to 67% of your degree be the job, right? Like without changing a thing. And so, so I think that's a really important point of the how we get there because any academic who's walking away today saying, well, that works for them, but our university would never be allowed to do that with our accreditor has missed the point. The point is this lives inside of an existing degree exactly as it's configured without any sub change, any academic committees, like this is changing the syllabus of your course and that requires no oversight. So that's, that's the first piece. Um, and I, I think that leads to the second piece of what do I think the future of higher ed is? I think higher ed is going to unbundle itself and we will see a distinction of higher ed has different value propositions. They're not all the same thing, right? I buy a Ferrari for a very different reason than I buy like a, I don't know, a Honda Accord, right? Or the 2013 like used CRV that I have right now. Some people like the institutions that are the Yales, the Stanfords, the MITs of the world, they will always continue to have the value prop they have of education for its own right. And that is a very, I think it is dangerous for the rest of us to assume that their value proposition is our value proposition, right? People don't choose REACH for the same reason they would choose one of those institutions. And that's okay, right? Honda is doing well, not being Ferrari. Um, but the rest of us have to understand what our value proposition is. And for us, that will be our ability to help you access the modern economy relative to the amount of debt it takes to do so. And if we cannot work more closely, the, the institutions that fail to recognize that will die, right? They, they will fail to get student enrollments. Uh, they will fail to pass increasing like uh, gainful employment legislation that is coming down the pipe and they will die. And so I think the future of higher ed, we will see this unbundling and this market segmentation. And that if you're not in that elite upper tranche, that for the rest of us, the way that you will survive is through industry partnership, is through credit for work, and is doing all of that without requiring students to take on um, any student loan debt or at a minimum exorbitant student loan debt. And groups that don't do that won't be here in the next 30 years. I love, and I'm not going to get it right, but you said how we access the modern economy versus the debt necessary to do so, or something like that. That's awesome, right? And that is true value proposition uh, speak that you're going through marketing foundations, you know, how do we define those value propositions? I can tell you, I think you've done a pretty darn good job of, uh, defining your value propositions, Mallory, uh, reach, reach university is doing some pretty, by the way, why did you name it reach? Just so curious. Yeah, we were originally the Oxford Teachers Academy, and then we merged with the REACH Institute, which was a graduate uh, program that was just doing alternative certification in California. And, um, you know, then we became a university. Oxford University as a name was taken. Um, and, and REACH as an institution, we really liked the name. It was, we liked honoring REACH Institute as sort of the forebearer here. But more to the point, it's become very relevant because, again, where we're reaching tend to be out into these most remote rural areas where there is no other higher ed alternative. There's no one else you can choose if you wanna live there. And so um, the reach of reach has become an unintentional uh, name that has been really appropriate. Yeah, and it's worth uh, doubling down uh, because if you missed it, um, if you don't have the time to go and uh, research it, uh, there is regional accreditation at work here through uh, WASC. So it's not like you get to the end of this episode and go, oh, well, we can't do any of that. That's that's some kind of other accreditation. They could do those things. No, regular old regional accreditation, like every other giant school in California that you could possibly think of in the Pac-12 Pac or what will cease to be the Pac-12 or 10 or whatever it is now someday. Uh, but that's important to note at the end of this episode. Mallory, uh, what a pleasure to speak with you and uh, uh, awesome knowledge bombs. Uh, you taught me a thing or two, and that means you taught Bill at least eight things if I learned too. Um, so Bill, and thanks for coming on again. My pleasure. Uh, always uh, glad to be with you, Joe and Mallory. I am going to encourage my network on LinkedIn to uh, listen to this particular podcast because this is for everybody. This isn't just for higher ed. Uh, I think businesses uh, and government agencies need to, to hear this message. 
Thank you both so much for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, my co-host, of course, you know him, you love him. He is the guru of online learning. He, he is Dr. Bill Pepicello. And my guest today, here he is again, ladies and gentlemen. She's Dr. Mallory all Palish, Chancellor of Reach University. You've just ed upped. The purpose of education is to help learners discover their aptitudes and interests, develop their skills, and then deploy that knowledge to benefit themselves and others. The Charles Koch Foundation, a nonprofit grant-making organization, works with leaders in education to remove barriers that stand in the way of all learners reaching their potential. They support individualized and flexible models that improve access and quality for millions of Americans. They also support apprenticeship and upskilling programs that connect learners to in-demand jobs that match their skills and interests. The foundation is looking for new partners to challenge the status quo and transform the post-secondary education system. Learn more about their partnership opportunities and apply for a grant at ckf.org. You can also find them on Twitter at at C. Koch Foundation and LinkedIn by searching Charles Koch Foundation.